When it comes to wine, the staff at Ball Square Fine Wine and Spirits in Somerville certainly know what they're talking about. But knowing about wine doesn't necessarily translate into success in the business of selling it. How is it, we wondered, that they, and those at most other wine shops for that matter, decide to stock their shelves from the literally tens of thousands of bottles of wine to choose from? Well, we decided to find out and spend an afternoon with Ball Square's wine buying extraordinaires, Dan Leck and Rebecca Rathor, and with them, four representatives from various wine distributors who arrive to taste and sell their wares. Dan and Rebecca have both been with the business for some time and shared with us their expertise and an inside look at how taste, price, and a bit of salesmanship all go hand in hand when it comes to buying wine. Hi, I'm Dan Leck. I'm the wine manager here at Ball Square Fine Wines in Somerville. Um, today we're going to be doing some tasting of new wines that salespeople want to place in our store and we'll evaluate them based on their overall quality and whether we think we can use them at this time. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm Dan's partner in crime here in the wine department at Ball Square Fine Wines. And we have about five different folks lined up today to come and taste us on their wares and see if we have anything that will be a good fit. We don't know if we'll buy anything, but it's always good to taste so that we can uh, talk about them with our customers and help them find something new. So basically Dan and I came up with this idea to better structure the way that we taste. We always took notes, or I at least always took notes by hand, but then technology, why are we fighting ourselves? So we ended up creating an Excel document that rates things by yeah. date that we tasted it, the vintage producer of the wine, the origin, meaning location in the world that it comes from, and the varietals or grapes that go into the actual wine itself. And then we take our tasting notes, we give ourselves a marker on the price because that'll change sometimes at any given moment, but depending on the season and whatnot. And then we have this thing that we really love, which is called our short list. And it gets a why, if it's really exceptional sometimes in this case. We give it three whys, and this one got a double Y. And this one has a GT question mark because it might actually make it for our fall grand tasting. Um, and that allows us to kind of streamline and filter what it is that we pick up. Uh, even in a given week, if we're not capable of buying it in that given moment, we'll revisit the things that make the short list and allow us to make better decisions about what things really struck our fancy as opposed to the rest of the mix that we have. The first so one rep to meet with Dan and Rebecca was Angus Smith right, from Vineyard Road Wines, who brought with him an array of Italian wines. From my, my agenda, uh, pardon me, is I have my future is truly 09, Pick pool rosé, um, those, those are great for me because right. it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. The truly worth the 08s, which you worked with, great wines, fantastic, but. But you don't have many. Yeah, I don't have many. Right. I mean, well, really have so, yeah, let's, I, think, I think we'll have no problem banging it out. We'll chase these guys and we'll okay. maybe put something together here. I need some okay. uh, Costello anyway, I need some rosé anyway. Okay, of course, just the as a, as a brief reminder that this is the. Verdicchio grape wine and place, but Castelli de Jay-Z, right? In the DOC, in off the sea, whereas there's Verdicchio and then Castelli, the mountain of Jay-Z, so a little more altitude, a little more linear, tight style, still I'm hoping citrus and, and uh, sea brine. And you can see the sea from Ball Square, so. We could, have, we could sometimes. grill some sardines on Friday and serve Verdicchio de Castelli de Gilles. We still so authentic. Right. So this is the Ciruli. This is their mid-tier, uh, up from the Edone, the Sediana. This is Sangiovese Cabernet Street, 6040 Sangiovese. That's a big, big boy. What's the alcohol? Beautiful. Puppy. Is you getting some heat there? Well, it's not so much heat. I just... It's got good spice. It's 13%. It's just... These guys are pretty restrained when it comes to yeah. I mean, they do, their next tier up, which is in the big, you know, murder weapon bottle and won't fit in anybody's racks, uh, still only goes 13.5. So, let's see. Some recent additions or things we've liked. Yes. Uh, the Ali Gote, Guasso. Guasso. Which I would love to do. The Riet Chenet. But I don't think this is the time for Riet Chenet. In total honesty, you would be the first retailer in Massachusetts to taste the old way. That's and that's God's honest truth. So there we go. So one case of Beaujolais. Yeah. Um, one case of Guasso. 
So that was Angus, uh, you know, obviously. From Vineyard Road. From Vineyard Road, yeah. Obviously, like many of our reps, he's very easy to get along with. He knows what we want. He knows our our jobs. He knows his job. So it's just a matter of what we were trying to do is figure out what he's going to pour here for our tasting this Friday. And as you saw, there were many options, and we just wanted to narrow it down based on wines that are going to sell, the cu our customers are going to like and pick up that day and take home, balanced with. Price. His agenda, our agenda, mostly our agenda because that's what we're the customer and he's the seller. So, price point is important and a variety of different wines that, that will interest people. Next is Michelle Cove from the Northwest Core Collection and Catherine Eaton from Ruby Wines to taste a variety of wines from Oregon. <laughs> so, it is a Pinot Gris. Um, just like always, all their wines are going to be just clean, crisp, simple. Almost naked, you know. No, there's not going to be a lot of oak characteristics or uh, fermentation, just very true to the varietal. It's going to taste like Pinot Gris from Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have the Bethel Heights Chardonnay out there, but we have that today too. Um, no, yeah. we'd love to try. Yeah, good. And um, the, the A to Z Chardonnay, for me, they're always fun to try side by side because there's such two extreme difference of characteristics and flavors, and they're both very somewhat true to Oregon. Um, or this one being, again, very just clean, simple, easy to drink. Um, and the Bethel Heights being a little bit more uh, characteristic, such as oak, and a little bit more of a mouthfeel. So they are going to switch. They used to have live certification in Salmon Safe on the back of this bottle, but now it's going to be Oregon Sustainable. Um, I fi Well, I figured between Oregon and Washington, there would be some movement coming soon to just kind of, well, for me, that comes through lines. Yeah. Like, well, maybe that's just my bias. I would prefer to buy something sustainable than necessarily organic or necessarily biodynamic. Right. We like this. We like yeah. this a lot. We're yeah. concerned about the price. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to be perfectly honest, yeah, because we tasted this with you a couple weeks ago. Okay. We yeah, love it. I did. I had that but it's, too. and even yeah. the same yeah. is true about the um, Albrino. I sell a lot of Albrino. Yeah. People come, like, the. That category, right? People come in, they'll have some crazy meal, they want to pair it, and I'm always just like, Albarino, Albarino. Yeah. Yeah. But at the price, people are That's curious, but they back away because it's also not Spain, right? So it's tricky. If it were, it, God, if it were 15 bucks, we'd sell through it instantly. Okay. So that's been our challenge with it because I'm still totally committed to the wine, but it's tricky. Yeah. It's just outside the realm of possibility, right. Yeah, right. and we're pushing it with this economy and. Yeah, and people and aren't as willing to take yeah. a risk at that price. Yeah. Okay. So that was Catherine from Ruby, who is our regular sales rep, but she had what we call a work with today, which is a person who represents uh, a winery or a group of wineries, as it is in this case. It was uh, Michelle from the Northwest Core Collection, which is a group of different Oregon wineries that they kind of market. She's more of a higher level intermediary, basically, who can. can go right back to the winery and communicate things, but also work with the wholesalers and directly with us. Right. Sometimes that has benefits on the price factor too. So. Next up was Tom Welch from United Liquors, who was affectionately nicknamed The Professor. And after only a few minutes, it was clear to see how he received the noteworthy moniker. As you guys know, Vouvray can be very dry, and very sweet, or somewhere in between. This is maybe in between. Yeah, I think it's remarkable. I love it. Variety. Lai Lai in uh, Mapuche dialect means uh, strong wind. Huh. So in the Lai which dialect? Mapuche dialect. Ma Mapuche, okay. Uh, wind is Lai, and if you double it, it means strong like wind. Like more intensity. Yeah, and by this vineyard uh, is quite interesting. They hired a uh, young dynamic winemaker named Pascal Marchand. He's originally from Montreal. He went to Burgundy in 1983 to learn about winemaking, and he's been a Burgundy winemaker pretty much ever since. So we have a Chardonnay, we have a Pinot Noir, both 2008 vintage. It's got a heck of a lot of cilantro on it. It's really kind of fun. Yeah, I don't think this has any oak dimension to it. So. Well, that was Tom from United. Uh, his nickname is The Professor, which you know, he kind of he kind of fits the mold with his glasses and his very 
kind of uh, precise. precise manner in the way he deals with wines, but you know, that's just a nickname that somebody else told us to call him, so we do. But uh, he's a great guy. He had some interesting wines from South America and some wines from the Loire Valley. This happens so often to us. We like a lot of wines, but we already have things like that. We put them in the notes. If we run out of the ones we already have or decide we need something new, or someone stops carrying something somewhere yeah, we'll one day go, magically. We'll go back to them. Um, Last up was Asa Waters, a wine marketing professional from Horizon Beverage Company. I think are just really tasty. Um, this is one of the things that we've tasted. I think I originally tasted back with Lorette and you years and years ago. Yeah. And uh, it's, to me, one of the most interesting of these things that we do it comes out of um, Marlboro, so on the South Island, northern tip of the South Island. But Riesling down there, similar to the stuff that you get in Australia, it develops a little bit of the petrol on the nose, but it has this wonderful kind of honey fruit to it. Um, beautiful acidity as well. We are getting down into a cooler climate, getting Carniana with a small amount of Cabernet and Syrah. I have the exact idea. 35 Carniana, 15 Cab, 5 Syrah. Wow. I got more Cab on it, but not in a bad way. Just in terms of the structure. That's what's so I, fun about the free rot. I mean, I like this wine for your store, too, because it's, you know, kind of the sign says upstairs, the wine must travel, and, and I think that's really what this is. I mean, it's from a region that people are starting to know in Spain, but it's a, you know, as a Vino Hoven, it's a completely different, it's a young wine, it's, it's not, you know, it's not this big, burly, thick, heavy wine. And actually, I argue that this vintage is even less so, which, in a good way. You still get that incredible herbaceousness, the green olive. I, I think it's a really fun wine. I have to sell myself long, but um, this, this to me is like an ultimate Thanksgiving one. It's got all of those things going on. Cranberry and, and all those kind of... See, I think Christmas. Uh, Where's my... Either way. My steak encrusted with rosemary. Continuing my theme of trying to do things that were a little bit non-standard, with the exception of peanut, which is kind of right on, right on the money. But, um, Cabernet from San Inez Valley you don't see too much. Uh, the Vogelsang Vineyard is in Happy Canyon, so it's actually pretty far away from um, the Fox and Tasting Room itself on Foxy Canyon Road. Um, it's down just east of San Inez. So you get the same sort of treatment that you would with the Pinot Noir, and you get a little bit more of that lifted, elegant fruit character without being Supple. overly jammy and, and you know getting the chocolate and the mocha yeah. like you would in Napa. <laughs> Asa is a, um, a wine... Uh, professional, he's not really a salesperson, he's not paid on commission, so he has a different agenda. But he tends to bring us a little bit more high-end materials, I would say, and today was no exception. The uh, Fog Dog Pinot and the Nita Priorat, particularly. So, very exciting for us to taste. Yeah. Not a lot we can do to pull the trigger right now. But we still have our notes and we'll revisit, so yeah, exactly. we're good to go. And yeah. he's not worried, because yeah. he knows how we roll. Yeah. And so, as the day of tasting and buying wound down, Rebecca and Dan reflected on their meetings and explained how filtering plays the biggest role in wine buying decisions. We had a great mix of folks who came in from different size portfolios, from the tiny, tiny little guys that import specialty items that you don't see everywhere, to slightly bigger portfolios, to very large portfolios, um, which is where we have to really do almost harder work to find stuff that's a little bit more off the beaten path, that fits our repertoire of stuff that's still is approachable and something cool and new for customers that they're going to get excited about like we do. That is about filtering. Our whole business is about filtering on many levels. Uh, Asa and Tom have thousands of wines to choose from thousands. and they bring us five or six a week and it's up to them to filter what they think we're going to want at that time. And it's up to us to filter what we think what our customers are going to want. That's the way it goes. We only buy one out of 10 to 20 wines that were shown. So yeah, it was, that's what we figured out when we did the math. We actually yeah. were like, wow, yeah. we we knew it was little, but when we actually think about it and we started blogging, we realized how few we actually pick up in a given week. And we do that for the sake of our customer and being able to have a great conversation with them about what exactly is in the bottle when they take it off the shelf. Mm -hmm.